All right, yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. So hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST for short. My name is Alex Caberly, and I'm a CCAST research specialist with the University of Arizona, and I'm based out of uh, Tucson. And I also am helping to coordinate the Southwest Non-Native Aquatics Community of Practice. So CCAST launched this webinar series in April 2020, and our webinars have been focusing primarily on controlling non-native aquatic species in support of our emerging community of practice. But we are also featuring additional aquatic species conservation and management case study presentations. And now I'd like to introduce Matt. Well, thanks, Alex. Uh, my name is Matt Graybaugh. I'm a science coordinator with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Science Applications Program and one of the co-directors of CCAST, which Alex just described. Today, we're going to have a, pre a split presentation by Chad Mellison and William Summer on native Paiute cutthroat trout restoration in the Sierra Nevadas of California. Chad Mellison is an aquatic biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where he's worked since 2001. William Summer is a retired senior environmental scientist from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, where he worked for 32 years. Uh, as a reminder, if you have questions as we go through the presentations, you can enter those in the chat box, and then I'll moderate and relay those to the speakers after the presentations. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Um, so Bill, if you share your screen, you should be able to start your, your slideshow presentation. Good morning, folks. Thanks for coming. Um, unfortunately, Chad doesn't have video on his computer, so you got to look at my ugly mug, I guess. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Chad, and he's going to give you guys an introduction and uh, background of the fish and the situation. And then I'm going to uh, discuss a chemical treatment project and some of the ongoing or the uh, litigation that we had to deal with and then uh, Chad's going to finish up with kind of an overview of um, recent activities and, and future direction. So with that I guess I'll hand it over to Chad. All right thanks Bill. Um, so as Bill said we're going to talk today about uh, efforts by California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service Forest Service, Trout Unlimited, and a few others, and talk about um, restoring arguably one of the rarest trouts uh, in the world. So go ahead, Bill, next slide. Um, in the Silver King Creek watershed, which we'll talk a little bit more in a minute, there's evidence of early settlers uh, throughout the watershed, including old cabins, um, some stone boy rock monuments, and really throughout the watershed in the aspen groves, there's abundant uh, basque carvings from the basque sheep herders that were there, including Joe Ansaris, as you can see on that lower left. That's a 1903 carving, and Ansaris was really key to this entire project, if you can believe that. Um, he was a Basque sheep herder in the area for a few decades. And in 1912, uh, he decided to move some Paiute cutthroat uh, out of their historic range above some falls, which we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, unknowingly, he probably saved this subspecies from extinction. Real quick, can you see yeah. that arrow when I, when I move it around? Yeah, I can. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead. Next one, Bill. All right. So here's here's the fish, Oncorhynchus clarkii salinaris, uh, first described to science in 1934 by J. O. Snyder. Uh, Selenaris, the subspecies name, uh, means rainbow of the moon, and uh, it really describes the color of the fish, uh, that kind of pinkish hue. 
And uh, it was one of the first animals listed under the Endangered Species Act, actually the precursor to the Endangered Species Act, the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966 uh, was listed. Uh, it was reclassified to threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1975. And uh, there was a 4D rule which allowed some state management of the species. Next, Bill. Um, Paiute cutthroat trout uh, evolved or diverged from Lahontan cutthroat trout, which is a very close cousin. And uh, we've got two photos of both fish here. And as you can see on the top with Lahontan cutthroat, you can see those black spots. And then below with Paiute cutthroat, they lack uh, body spotting and that's really the biggest difference between the two species when you're looking at them um, The Lahontans also kind of have a little more yellow to them and the Paiute have that purplish hue coloration that I talked about earlier and another Distinguishing feature of Paiute cutthroat are their par marks and those are those kind of oval looking markings as Bill's pointing with his cursor they retain those uh, throughout their life. Usually um, adult fish, adult trout lose those par marks as they get older, um, but Paiute tend to retain those. All right, next. So here's a map of the Western United States and overlaid are various native trout. You can see West Slope, Cutthroat, Yellowstone, Colorado, Greenbacks, Rio Grande, Bonnevilles, etc. And you can see the Lahontan there in the light blue. They're wide ranging. And then Paiute, if you squint really hard, you can see <laughs> their tiny little distribution there. So most native trout distributions are spread over entire basins or even multiple basins. And again, Paiute cutthroat trout only occur in Silver King Creek, one stream, which is part of the larger Carson River Basin. Next. So I mentioned Silver King Creek as the historic range of the species. Uh, they have been transplanted um, into four other widely ranging. Uh, streams throughout the Sierra Nevada. They were actually put in more places than this, but these are the only four that um, persisted. So in the North Fork Cottonwood Creek there in the White Mountains, uh, they were put there in 1947. And then in Cabin Creek, just to the north there in 1968. And that same year into Shark Tooth Creek, and then 1972, uh, the year I was born, wow, that's pretty cool, uh, Stairway Creek. Those are shark tooth and stairway are on the Sierra National Forest, whereas Cabin and North Fork are on the Inyo National Forest, and then Silver King Creek's on the Humboldt Toyabe National Forest. All right, next slide, Bill. So we're going to talk more about Silver King Creek and the historic range. So this map that you see here, uh, it's going to be a reoccurring map, so we'll talk a little bit here <clears throat> to orient yourself. Uh, the stream flows to the north. So from the bottom of the slide to the top is the direction of the watershed. And I like to think of Silver King Creek, I like to split it up into thirds. Um, so the lower Silver King Creek from the Silver King Gorge downstream to the confluence of the East Fork Carson River um historically was Lahontan cutthroat trout waters and then there's a series of fish barriers there in Silver King Gorge and those are depicted by those red uh pluses so you can see all the various barriers within the watershed and then the middle reach of Silver King Creek or that purple is the historical range of Paiute cutthroat trout 
which is about 11 miles of stream of Silver King and various parts of some tributaries there. So you got the middle reach and then the upper reach of Silver King Creek above Llewellyn Falls was historically fishless, uh, including Corral Valley and Coyote Valley, those tributaries off to the east. All that historically fishless waters until 1912, as I mentioned, when Juan Saras grabbed some fish and put them above the Wild Falls. Next. So Silver King Gorge uh, has several impassable waterfalls, a uh, pretty inhospitable place, difficult to get into. Uh, and you can see some of the photos there that show some of these, these falls. And the only fish that occurred above these falls were Paiute cutthroat trout. Um, next slide, Bill. The fish below and above the canyon there, as you can see, the fish above were Paiute cutthroat and then uh, other trout species that were planted above there over the years. And then the fish below was really the whole fish assemblage in uh, East Fort Carson, including native and non-native fish. And you can see all the, the list of species there. And so we know these barriers were uh, good fish barriers because of the lack of um, the native, native fish below. We do not see those fish above. Next slide. And then here's a photo of Llewellyn Falls, the upstream distributor, uh, upstream barrier for Paiute cutthroat trout. So no fish can get above this. It's I think 12, 15 foot drop there. And next slide, and this is what upper Silver King, Upper Fish Valley looks like, where Joe Onstara spent his summers with his sheep and decided to put fish up here, presumably, so he could do other things and carve wonderful photos into the Aspen stands. So the historically fishless areas of Upper Silver King Creek uh, was a glacially formed valley and sits right around 8,000 feet elevation. All right, next slide. So here's that map again. So some, a lot of history in terms of fisheries management has occurred in um, the Silver King Creek watershed. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, that the fish was first described in 1934 we have records of rainbow trout stocking in Upper Fish Valley in 1949. So all the fish throughout the entire Silver King Creek watershed um, became hybridized, except for some small sections of Fly Valley Creek and Four Mile Canyon Creek. So up until the 60s, that was really all we had. Um, and that one out of basin population in uh, North Fork Cottonwood Creek. So in 1964, uh, the state embarked on their first rote known treatment in the upper basin. You can see in the, in the white, some of the rote known treatments. Um, that failed and so they did it again in 1976, retreated Silver King Creek. And then in 1977, they treated Coyote and Corral Valley Creeks. And the Coyote Creek treatment failed, so they redid that one in 87 and 88. And then um, Silver King Creek, again, the upper portion was treated during a three-year treatment, 91 through 93. After all those treatments, um, Paiute, cutthroat trout were uh, kind of restored to all those sections. Again, all outside of their historical range above Llewellyn Falls and the falls on Corral and Coyote Valley Creeks. 
Next slide. I just want to jump in here for a second, Chad, and say that yeah, go for it, Bill. on these uh, various treatments, there are um, various causes for failure over the years. And um, as Chad mentioned, these treatments, and in the uh, 64 and 76, they were uh, single year treatments. And um, part of the problem, too, is they didn't know, you know, they didn't have the genetic tools that we have today. And so, you know, some, some places they thought they had pure fish where they really didn't. And so, you know, those served as a seed stock to re restock uh, some of these stream reaches. Um, and then in, you can see here in the later treatments, we did multiple year treatments. And, um, you know, that actually took care of the survivors. All right, hand it back, Chad. Thanks, Bill, for clarifying some of that. So after the early 90s treatments, um, went back in and started restocking uh, Upper Silver King Creek uh, with Paiute Cutthroat Trout. If you can click one more, Bill. And one more, and one more. So here's uh, the years and the actual numbers of fish that were used and their donor source or the donor stream. So in the last year that up that treatment was 93. So 94 started restocking and our donor streams consisted of Coyote Valley and Fly Valley Creeks. And you can see the numbers there. And over the course of six years, we restocked just over 600 fish from these um, donor sources. We get the population up and running again. Next slide. So we have a very extremely robust um, population estimates for Upper Silver King just due to the amount of time that uh, the agencies have been up there monitoring this population. And a lot of it's been electrofishing information and snorkeling. Go ahead, Bill. And over the years, um, this is really an average over since 1964. These numbers are kind of average. So as you can see, Upper Silver King Creek, which has um, the majority of the habitat, occupied habitat, has the largest population. And so you, what you see is on the left are the, the various streams that have pipe cutthroat trout in them and the amount of habitat in terms of stream kilometers and then the adult um, population number. So this does not include young of year and juvenile fish. So these are fish generally over 150 millimeters. So again, Upper Silver King Creek on average over 40 years is right around 600 fish and then you can read down all the smaller tributaries have much smaller population levels which you would expect just due to the size of the stream um, in terms of width and the amount of habitat occupied in terms of length all right next we've also done some age and growth uh, studies with these populations and so on the y-axis you have a total length in millimeters and the x is the age of the fish and the lines depict various um, various populations so the yellow and i guess light blue color are upper fish valley and silver king creek uh, in two different years and they kind of match each other pretty well and then you've got the headwater tributaries so that's four mile and fly in pink and then the Coyote Valley Creek population in green. And as you can see, with these smaller uh, habitats, these fish just don't grow as large. And so um, they have their, their different sizes at different ages. Next. So what are, what are the main threats to these fish. The number one threat is really hybridization with non-native trout, specifically rainbow trout. Their limited distribution 
um, and susceptible to catastrophe. So this includes drought, fires, floods, you name it, with these small habitats. Um, as we know from the literature and other fish, these smaller habitats are susceptible to these catastrophes. Uh, their long-term population viability is also in question, um, again, due to the literature, particularly with cutthroat trout. There's minimum um, habitat sizes that these fish require to persist over time, and none of the populations, including the out-of-basin out populations, meet these minimum habitat requirements. Uh, this fish is highly vulnerable to unregulated angling. We have evidence of uh, heavy angling mortality in the in the 60s. And so the state has kept Siller King Creek uh, closed to fishing for quite some time. And then the historic sheep and cattle grazing that has occurred uh, in the watershed, again, since the late 1800s, really took a toll on the habitat um, up in this area. And I am Happy to say that since 1995, there's been no great livestock grazing whatsoever in the watershed. And in uh, 2012, the Forest Service officially closed the allotment to all livestock grazing. All right, next, Bill. So, Actually, in 1985 is the year we wrote our uh, Fish and Wildlife Service wrote the original recovery plan, and they covered a lot of those threats that I just described. And as Bill's going to take over here in a second, um, we wanted to move recovery forward into the historical range. So in 2004, we uh, revised the recovery plan to start talking about how we would go about doing that. And so the number one a priority in the plan was to remove non-native trout in the historic range of Llewellyn Falls. Then to reintroduce Paiute into their historical habitat, uh, protect and enhance all occupied habitat, including those isolated out-of-basin populations, continue to monitor and manage existing and reintroduce populations, and also to do a better job on providing public information and education on what it is uh, we were doing up in Silver King Creek. So with that, I believe, Bill, I am passing the baton back to you. Thanks, Chad. In the original recovery plan, they um, identified actually a restoration in the White Mountains uh, to meet the plan. And um, since nobody had really gone through the uh, canyon or gorge there and identified what might be the historic range and uh, curious enough. So in, in uh, 1994, I hiked through that gorge with Richard Flint and uh, we found uh, a number of, of uh, waterfalls there that either uh, individually or in combination have provided the barrier that uh, Chad referred to earlier. and. Uh, we had some engineers and fish passage experts go up and evaluate the various falls. And so after that, we uh, worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service um, and the Forest Service to uh, revise, you know, what we, <clears throat> what we knew now about the historic range of these fish and what to do in the, in the recovery of them. Um, so that's, that kind of led off to defining the uh, the restoration project as this area you see in red here on the map, um, basically extending from the gorge upstream to Llewellyn Falls and including some lower ends of tributaries that uh, look to uh, be historic habitat. And so th this is approximately 11 miles of uh, habitat that we decided to target for a chemical treatment. And then we would uh, restock fish from these source populations back into the historic range. 
And as Chad pointed out, there are out of basin populations that um, hopefully they can draw upon to help in this effort. So look, looking at the numbers of fish, um, the headwater tributaries that were above the historic range were small populations and fragmented, even upper Silver King. And uh, we looked at, crunched some numbers estimating how many fish could inhabit uh, Silver King in the historic range. And uh, it would more than uh, double the number of Paiute cutthroat in, in the drainage. So we started uh, doing uh, our homework for the project, we thought, and uh, this included um, following through with some uh, earlier ma macroinvertebrate studies. Interestingly enough, uh, that they were done in the 70s and 80s, mostly to evaluate the impacts on grazing. And uh, from 1990 on, we used some of the same stations and added more to evaluate um, the effects or impacts of rodon. And we're somewhat limited on control sites as a good portion of the basin was, was treated in these various chemical treatments. And, you know, we had a few in Fly Valley and Four Mile and Tamarack Creek in the headwaters, um, but a lot of this other habitat had already previously been treated. We came out with some uh, publications. There's some, um, this one here was in the Journal of Fisheries Management. There were some others that were um, technical reports within the department. Um, and then the Mark Vinson is one of the co-authors. He went on to uh, do another, another paper that was in the fisheries. And uh, lar largely we found that um, the macroinvertebrates rapidly recolonize the stream and uh, that some of the historic land uses like the, uh, the grazing and uh, other things that um, Chad referred to had more of an impact on the invertebrate uh, concentrations or uh, populations. In addition to grazing, um, historically they um, did a lot of logging in portions of the basin um, for the Comstock mines in um, Nevada. What they would do is they, you know, they cut the trees down, they cut them up in uh, shorter lengths, and then they'd build a dam in the stream and blow it with dynamite to transport the logs downstream. So you can imagine that's not too good for bugs or fish. And to this day, there's still piles of this wood that were cut and stacked and ready to transport. Lower Corral Valley and even along Silver King in various spots. Uh, we also uh, looked at the amphibian populations. Um, we have uh, the tree frog here, which is widespread in the basin still. Uh, Western toad, also widespread. Uh, Sierra yellow legged frog, which uh, we saw a number of places. In uh, Silver King, there was a huge population up in White Cliff Lake, and uh, we'd see them up in Upper Fish Valley, even up around Fly Valley Creek. And then they seemed to disappear in the early to mid 90s. And um, we think it was because of the uh, chytrid fungus got into the basin, because White Cliff Lake, for example, had never been treated, and there was a huge population there that just winked out. And we know that uh, in Silver Creek, which is just the south, they actually documented the chytrid fungus. Um, there are also a uh, Yosemite toad in the neighborhood. Their main distribution is, is to the south of this basin, but uh, we have had some sightings in the basin. So one thing we did when planning the treatments, we looked to do them later in the year when frogs and toads uh, had metamorphosed out of the, uh, you know, the aquatic life stages. So then we um, tried to move forward with our project and bring it to the public. And uh, we encountered a group of uh, anti uh, known folks that um, did their best to try to 
uh, Duralis. And uh, so they uh, enlisted the help of the Center for uh, Biological Diversity. Need to, we need to redo those letters there. Um, and they um, <clears throat> actually sued the Forest Service on compliance of their NEPA document, which was a, a environmental assessment at the time, as inadequate. And they they uh, they prevailed in the courts. Um, so then we came back and they revised the document in '04. And uh, we went to a meeting with the Lahontan Regional Water Quality Control Board. And, um, you know, the, our opponents showed up there and, and made a big stink. And the board um, was hesitant to approve the project and suggested that we conduct more studies before we move forward. So we worked closely with them to design uh, macroinvertebrate studies to move forward. And we came back again in 2005, and um, now the um, folks had enlisted the uh, Californians against toxic substances, uh, and they uh, filed lawsuits. It was too late to go after the, the California CEQA laws, but uh, they were successful and got a, uh, the ear of the judge, if you will, in um, overturning their environmental assessment uh, in terms of it being an adequate document. And so uh, they filed an injunction to bar us from doing the treatment. So at that point, the director of the department was, was furious and uh, he just told, told us and our agency that you know, we walked away from the, the treatment at that time. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of a lot of variables involved in that. So it, it pretty much was a train wreck for the project at that time. And we had to kind of retool and go back to the drawing board. And uh, <clears throat> so in 2009 and 10, uh, we, we worked with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and the Forest Service to complete a joint uh, environmental in, impact statement and, or EIR too and uh, we brought this document out to the public in uh, 2011 and again the opponents of the Brotnone worked with the CAPS group and challenged the EIS EIR and also the MPDES permit and they were successful and and getting another injunction filed on, on this environmental document that uh, kind of ground us to a halt with another injunction. And uh, so finally in 2013, um, the, the judge that had um, ruled against us had retired and they had a new judge in the federal district court and he overturned the injunction. So that, that gave us, um, an open, an open light to move forward with this. So we, uh, we started a fish kill school and uh, prepared to do the chemical treatment. And so it involved uh, hours of training. We trained folks on safety and uh, the project and um, dealing with the chemicals or working with chemicals and and then there was a lot of on-site training as well. And, uh, you know, this is a respirator is an all too uh, common site these days. Uh, we did the uh, flow measurements throughout the basin to be able to understand what concentrations of rotenone we need to use in the system. And along with this, we did dye studies using uh, rotamine dye, uh, biologically inert, um, dye that we'd put in and then we'd measure the time and distance through the system. And, and this would help inform us where to set our drip stations in the system. We also mapped uh, water courses. We took um, satellite imagery and overlaid it on maps and then um, had crews go out in the field and map uh, 
other water courses, such as these ponds here. And they were all integrated into our, our maps of the project area. And you see here that uh, this track over here is uh, their favorite lunch spot. This project was done in the wilderness. So there was a lot of logistics involved in getting uh, the equipment for the treatment and the chemicals and the food and people's personal gear back into the wilderness. And you can see down here is a big pile of gear that uh, had to be packed in. And we basically operated out of two locations. We had a, um, I'll show you a map in a second here, but the treatment part operated out of Collins Cow Camp. And then we ran a neutralization station downstream of the project. And so we had these two separate camps that had to be um, uh, supplied by horse packing. And we counted something like 99 trips to get all the gear in and out of both sites. So in the chemical treatment, uh, this is a, uh, a drip station here. This is a poster boy for drip stations. We used uh, a newer chemical, CFT legumine, and treated at a one part per million. And in each of the years, 2013, 2014, and 2015. And we ran these drip stations for six hours. Um, basically, they were set up with two hour travel times between them. And we wanted a, a sufficient you know, overlap in, these, in the timing so that we made, made sure or ensured that we had adequate toxicity uh, in each reach during the treatment. And um, so here's a picture of a person uh, monitoring their flow rate. And we also use backpack uh, spray teams to treat slow moving waters and backwater areas and, and some springs and seeps and just uh, wetted areas and make sure that, you know, they may not necessarily hold fish, but they might uh, contribute water and, and provide a haven for fish from the chemicals. Here's a map of the treatment area. And uh, so here's Connell's camp at the top where we uh, stage the treatment from. And then here's uh, the neutralization station downstream of the treatment. So it was, our goal was to keep it hot to these falls, at least. Um, it was really impractical to set up a neutralization station any closer upstream than we did just because of the terrain. And so then we broke the project area into five teams. The slower one was, was operated out of neutralization. And then the other four teams were out of columns. And you can see here at each of these stars is where the drip stations were located for the treatment. Uh, Tamarack Creek had really slow uh, travel time. So we ended up with a, a lot of more drip stations there. And they were uh, closer together maybe only a quarter mile apart in some cases. And so some of these were man or staffed by one person for two drip stations, but generally we try to have a person on each drip station in the main stem and other spots. And again, we put together a map of the whole project area and the spray teams uh, had the GPS receivers on as they uh, treated the various uh, waters they were assigned to in their areas. And then we had a couple of GIS gurus in camp. When they'd come in, they'd, they'd load their uh, tracks onto the map so we could evaluate and make sure that they had covered all the areas that we need treated. And there were a couple instances where they hadn't uh, hit them, and, and so we were able to redeploy them out to treat those areas that hadn't been hit. So this was a pretty valuable tool in ensuring that we treated all of the area that needed to be treated. But um, <clears throat> we also had to use um, road known prayer flags because you need all the help you can get with this kind of project. And in fact, uh, we had some obstacles along the way and, 
no matter how much you plan, there's always some unforeseen um, problems or calamity that can arise. And in uh, 2003, we had that giant fire in Yosemite, 2013, excuse me. We had that giant fire down in Yosemite, the Rim Fire. And that just poured smoke over the project area, as you can see here. And we were in the direct line of the smoke plumes. And that, that's kind of what it looked like up there. It was, it was pretty bad air quality, uh, as we're seeing again in California this year. And then in 2014, we had a, a norovirus outbreak. One of the uh, participants in the project brought it in the camp, in uh, the treatment camp. And of the 35 or so folks that we had up there, about half of them came down with this norovirus. Um, fortunately, though, um, we got the treatment done before it really hit in camp, and it made for a tough time for some folks to get out of there. 2015, uh, one of our crew members had um, a new asthma medication, and he reported to us when he got in the camp the first day that uh, he was having some trouble breathing, and you know, obviously that's quite alarming. And fortunately, our um, safety officer had done his homework, and he had already uh, contacted you know, the local hospitals and even the helicopter um, evacuation crews. So he was already dialed in. Um, he called in to them on satellite phone, and we had a helicopter in Upper Fish Valley at Connell's camp within 40 minutes. And they got the fellow out to a, a local hospital. And uh, fortunately, he was okay. And, uh, you know, they got him some different medication and then, you know, he was fine, but uh, frustrated that he couldn't be in and help with the project. So we used a number of me measures to assess the rotenone toxicity. Um, one common method is using live cages. We put uh, four or five fish in the cage and then, you know, the goal is make sure that they're all killed by the um, rotenone. And then as the uh, crews are covering the landscape, doing their job, they're looking to make sure that all the fish they see in the stream are dead or document if they see any fish alive. Um, we also used a couple of test sections with block stains. And this, this, we did this to help us um, count the numbers of fish and then uh, it might help us get some idea what the densities and numbers of pipe trout might be in, in the section or in this uh, stream along with uh, checking for mortality. Uh, we took a lot of water samples through the basin and at the neutralization station um, to help evaluate the efficacy of the treatment and um, the performance of the neutral, neutralization station. We'll get into that more later. Also the overall project execution, looking at, you know, would things go smoothly? Did they run drip stations on time? And uh, you know, the, all the areas get hit by spray teams. Uh, this is a graph of the rotenone toxicity that we uh, measured from the water samples. And this is the uh, concentration of rotenone and a variety of monitoring sites. And this is early in the treatment. This is mid-treatment. And this is uh, day after. And you can see we reached target toxicity at all of the um, stations that we monitored um, during the peak treatment. So below the treatment, we set up the neutralization station to uh, limit the treatment area, obviously. We didn't want the rotenone going below the area that we wanted to restore the fish to. Uh, this is a photo here of the neutralization station in the uh, 93 treatment. And at that time, we used uh, uh, permanganate, you can see here in the foreground, and we put it in these drums, and you keep this witch's brew going and, and drip it into the stream. And uh, it, it was more tricky to keep these 
going at the uh, proper uh, proper rate for neutralization, which is approximately three parts per million to one part per million rotenone. And that allows for uh, uptake by the rotenone and neutralizing it. And uh, there's also uptake by the biological system. Uh, so you leave a little buffer in there too. And so in this treatment, we used uh, um, a different technique with a motorized auger that just uh, you fill up the hopper here and it uh, distributes uh, powdered form permanganate into the stream. Um, and it does require monitoring and a generator, which you know was an issue we had to work out with the wilderness folks. So to evaluate the um, the treatment and the uh, neutralization, we ran um, 24 hour sampling of uh, water water quality samples, measure rotenone, and and the folks used a steel colorimeter here to uh, estimate the uh, permanganate concentrations. And with that, they almost had a, a, an ability to do real-time adjustment of the permanganate in the system and, and uh, respond to the increase and decrease of the rotenone. So they um, sample the permanganate just below the detox and then down at the 30 minute travel time site downstream where uh, we needed to have complete uh, detoxification of the rotenone. And this is a graph showing you the um, rotenone toxicity at neutralization. So the, the red line here is the um, concentration of rotenone again, and this is uh, through time. And this is above the neutralization site and it reached upwards of 35 parts per million at, uh, at peak treatment and then tailed off through time as uh, the headwaters, um, The, the, um, the water flushed through the system and flushed the, the rotenone down through the system. And so it, it um, you know, reduced as we go through time. And um, the yellow line here is below the neutralization and it shows you that you know, we couldn't detect any rotenone at the 30 minute mark until just Almost at the very end, there was a slight blip there. I don't know. Can you guys see? Can you see that? Is it? We got the. Uh, I've got the. Uh, yeah, you can see that blip, Bill. There's a slight blip here at the end, where um, some rotenone in this one year, and I think it was uh, 13, got through the uh, detoxification or neutralization. But it, you know, it was more of a theoretical than a actual biological impact because it was just at the uh, measurable limit and you know we didn't have any fish killed in the live cages below uh, neutralization at the 30 minute mark and in the other years um, we had no uh, rotenone at that 30 minute mark so um, this technique really worked quite well for evaluating um, the, the uh, neutralization it is a, at a cost though. I, we spent a great deal of money uh, on the water quality monitoring and uh, processing of the samples, to the tune of about $30,000 a year. Um, so it is a good tool, but it's very expensive. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it back to Chad here and he's gonna uh, break into the evaluation, further evaluation of the treatment using environmental uh, DNA. All right, thanks, Bill. So that yeah, we treated the treated up watershed, and then to evaluate the efficacy of that, uh, we used environmental DNA as well as electrofishing to make sure that there were no rainbow trout left in the system. So here's a map of all the locations we took eDNA samples. They were basically 150 meters apart from the barriers in the gorge all the way up to Llewellyn Falls, including uh, some of the tributaries as you see there. And we did it in 16, 17, and 18. 
Um, total of 190 samples. There's 190 dots there. And 16 and 17, we sent them to the National Genomics Center, uh, the Rocky Mountain Research Station, and then they processed those samples for us. And then in 2018, CDFW got their genetics lab up and running, and we sent the samples uh, to them in 2018. Bottom line, uh, no rainbow or brown trout detected throughout the system, um, but we were starting to get Paiute cutthroat trout hits towards uh, 2018 throughout the system. So we know um, we started to get cutthroat coming over those barriers from upstream sources into the system. Next. Um, in preparation of getting Paiute tr cutthroat trout back into the historic range, we developed a genetics management plan that would help guide our uh, restocking efforts. We we wanted to make sure we were uh, increasing the genetic diversity to the, uh, the best we could. So that uh, meant we needed to go out and take genetic samples of all of our donor populations and then come up with a plan, you know, numbers of the fish from what populations to, you know, really bump up that, that genetic diversity. So this is a really important plan for us. And, um, all of our future restocking efforts are going to follow this plan. Next. Part of the plan was to look at uh, past genetic uh, studies and then bring it up to speed with some, some newer um, genetics. So in the, uh, right around 2000, we sampled all of the populations, known populations. And as you can see, it really split it off into three different groups, and this um, followed uh, those historic stockings that I talked about earlier in the talk. So um, really, if, if you start at the bottom, that Fly Valley, so things in yellow are the source population. So Fly Valley population was used to restock Upper Silver King, Coyote Valley, and Corral Valley, and that came out in the genetics. Uh, Four Mile Canyon in the upper watershed uh, was used to stock uh, Shark Tooth Creek, and they, they lumped together. And then the North Fork Cottonwood population was used to stock Stairway and Cabin Creek. And so the genetics showed that um, uh, they followed that stocking history. Next. And then as I mentioned, um, Later, we resampled all these populations except for Cabin Creek. And um, we see the same pattern, which again is not surprising. But what did surprise us though, was um, we started to see genetic drift just within you know a 10 year time frame from the original samples in 2000 to 2010. So those arrows are showing that the 2000s to um, that kind of 2010, 2011 time frame, and we're already seeing a little bit of drift. And this actually surprised me. I didn't think you could detect that, but with these new um, genetic uh, um, sampling techniques, uh, they're really able to drill down and and show some of this. So this was kind of surprising and, and pretty interesting. Next. And we published uh, just a couple of years ago, yet again, some more genetic information using a PCA analysis. And one of the, well, there were kind of two questions that were kind of unresolved. One was, how long ago did Paiute cutthroat trout diverge from Lahontans? I think I mentioned earlier in the talk, prior analyses with um, less powerful genetic tools really put it at five to 8,000 years um, for divergence. But with our new uh, rad data, uh, we were able to show that uh, they diverged from each other, Lahontan, Cutthroat, and Paiute, substantially longer than that. And um, they came up with a range of 180 to 260,000 years 
ago is when they when they diverged from each other. So that was pretty substantial uh, difference. And then um, the other thing was we didn't have good data to show um, how divergent these two subspecies were from each other. And so this PCA plot really shows that. So on the one on the left side of the plot shows all the Lahontan cutthroat trout populations and how divergent they are from each other. And then if you look way over to the right, that uh, cluster of black squares, that's where Paiute cutthroat trout are. So this really solidified and showed a clear phylogenetic signal showing the separation LCT and Paiute and um, suggested continued recognition of Paiute as a distinct cutthroat trout group. All right, next. So we had all these great things going for us with the treatment and whatnot, and then Mother Nature throws us yet another <clears throat> wrinkle. Um, if you're not from around these parts, you may not have known that we had um, severe drought conditions for about five years from 2012 through 2016. And this was uh, the worst um, drought cycle in, on record in terms of severity and length. Um, these pictures, and it's not uh, just summer, summer drought. Uh, we had drought in all four seasons. These pictures are from Silver King in 2012. And it's kind of hard to tell on that picture on the left, that light colored, it looks like sand on the bottom of Silver King Creek, but that's actually um, anchor ice formed throughout the whole system. And the other two photos are of Llewellyn Falls, which are completely frozen. And I should point out too, that this photo was taken at 8,000 feet in the Sierra Nevada in January. And you can see there is no snow whatsoever. So we had these conditions um, for about five years and it really took a toll on our population numbers, which we'll show in the next slide. So here's our long data set that I mentioned from 1964 through 2020. And some of those breaks where we have no data or um, wrote no treatments, or we just couldn't get out there um, for various reasons. And so I'm gonna hurry up, but uh, I guess the main point of this is you can see the impact of the drought conditions over to the right, that really population really crashed. So we'll go to the next slide because we're running out of time. Um, to augment this population, we went back to the North Fork Cottonwood Creek and grabbed some fish. This is uh, was a epic journey, but we grabbed 86 fish and put them back into Silver King Creek, uh, 71 years, almost to the day that they were taken originally. So that was cool. Um, next slide. In 2017, also we had a really large landslide. Bill, can you show, yeah, uh, thank you with your cursor. Um, so after 2016, fifth year of the drought, we had um, one of the biggest snow pack years on record, and this caused this landslide, um, dammed the creek, created a lake, and sent a lot of sediment down the stream. Next slide. So after all the eDNA, uh, Results came back. We felt confident the treatment was effective. In 2019, we restocked the historic range uh, for the first time in almost 100 years. Uh, great collaborative group effort. Um, the only person missing from that group is Bill, unfortunately, was injured on a previous trip in there. And um, lesson learned there, never get on a animal named lightning. Right, Bill? Um, he got bucked from the horse and unfortunately got injured. But we got the fish back in there and our recovery team won the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service 2020 Recovery Champions Award, which is one of the highest awards that Fish and Wildlife Service gives out. So we're very proud of that. 
and future efforts we're going to continue stocking uh, we're not done by any stretch uh, we're going to continue our genetic and population monitoring our habitat monitoring and still protect uh, pike cutthroat trout into the future next slide uh, we just finished a couple weeks ago our five-year status review uh, this link down here on the slideshow will get you there if you're interested in our status review next slide uh, always want to give a shout out to all the groups involved. Uh, rarely can anybody or any agency do this uh, alone. So we had a lot of great people and a lot of support. Part of that is um, we're all amazingly uh, in lockstep, you know, which in any kind yeah. of endeavor with different government organizations is really rare. Very true, very true. That that helped through all the trials and tribulations that Bill uh, that Bill mentioned. Um, so it did take an army. So with that, I think uh, we're ready for any questions. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Chad and Bill. Um, so you guys know we're we're past the top of the hour, but if you guys are free for a few extra minutes, we can go ahead and address uh, a couple of questions. Sure. Okay, cool. So a um, few questions came in in the chat um, and we probably do have, we can stay on for one or two more if there are any additional burning questions people would like to put in the chat function of Zoom. Um, so first a couple technical questions that we got. Um, you know, one question early on you presented the the size versus age of the, uh, of the pipe cutthroat trout populations in different streams. And technical question was how you knew the age of the fish when you did that the sampling. Yeah, well, these fish were uh, um, sampled in electrofishing in these various years and sites, and um, we actually collaborated with um, Sacramento State University and they had a grad student age scale samples. And so the scales kind of act like uh, tree rings in a sense, and so you can uh, age a fish by counting kind of rings on the scales. That's how that's done. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and um, yeah, Jesus commented in here as well, so growth rings, so that makes sense. Um, another question regarding the you know, technical approach for the eDNA sampling that you presented on later uh, was when you did the testing for rainbow trout, if you had a positive control with the eDNA sampling? Um, and Jesus, if that if I didn't say that correctly, you can feel free to jump on here as well. Yeah, I just was wondering because a lot of times uh, I know people who have done DNA and, and you need so much water to have results that I wonder you guys use a, a, a target species that you know existed uh, and, 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 and test the DNA for that one to make sure that the amount of water you will use in the procedure was something that allows to you to actually detect a species that is present? Yeah, that's, that's a real good question. Um, first off, we followed the protocol of the Rocky Mountain Lab and, and uh, you know, we, I forget the volume that we measured, but we followed it five liters, Bill. Five liters. And then yeah. we, we sampled every, what, 100, 100 meters? 150 meters. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we tried to make sure that our sampling um, frequency was adequate, you know, to meet, um, you know, the statistical requirements of uh, being able to encounter these fish. And um, secondly, as Chad had mentioned, we did um, get positive hits on Paiute trout in multiple locations. So we, we know yeah, that. They, sorry, Bill, they had a, a rainbow trout panel already developed the lab did because um e, you know edna is used a lot for these types of projects so the the rainbow trout genetic panel was already developed by the lab so we were fortunate there i believe we had to do um develop a Paiute cutthroat trout panel yeah so that was did. something good yeah awesome thank you guys um, so we had a couple questions. I'll try to kind of merge here, uh, talking about the, you know, kind of the future of the cutthroat trout populations. So 
Um, some of this may be included in the recovery plan, so maybe uh, for the five-year status update. Um, but anyway, a couple of questions here. So the first is, what is the outlook on being able to provide habitat of adequate size for the pipe cutthroat trout in the future? And I think kind of related to that was a question from uh, Pat about the fate of the pike cutthroat trout populations in the White Mountains, which I think you mentioned uh, kind of in the middle of your presentation. Yeah, so um, I probably failed to mention that the historic range, um, well, it was 11 miles, and that provides um, well above the minimum required habitat for long-term persistence um, for the species. So uh, we think the future is very bright for this fish um, now that we've got it back into its historic range or starting to get it back into its historic range. Plus so we'll I think, continue to maintain uh, these headwater populations as well. And I, I would think at some point in the future that you know the agencies will um, do some kind of supplemental stocking program to keep uh, mixing the genetics between uh, mm -hmm. these different populations is appropriate. And as far as the White Mountains go, um, you know, there's a couple populations that you know of there, and, and uh, there was there was some talk about expanding the uh, cottonwood population, but um, you know, I don't know where that'll be now that we've done um, this treatment in Silver King. It'll probably be up to the bishop uh, office of the department to kind of how they want to approach the management there with the with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Yeah, right now we don't have any plans, um, but it's certainly immediate plans. All our focus right now is on Silver King and getting the repopulation efforts continuing. Once that's done, we might start looking at that. Uh, one interesting thing happened, though, that Cabin Creek population uh, started to come downstream into another tributary called Lighty Creek. And we now have individual Paiute in Lighty Creek, which um, does not have any non-natives in it. So that population is kind of expanding into Lighty Creek. That's awesome. So it sounds like things are looking good at this point, um, despite all the challenges that you guys went through. It seems like it's been a quite a ride over there on Silver King Creek. Um, so we had a couple additional questions in there, but I think as you proceeded with the slides, I think you covered those. So I think we'll go ahead and call it there. Um, so um, a couple closing comments here. Um, Alex put a couple uh, links in the chat box for the case study as well as the main link to CCAST. Um, so you can check those out if you haven't already. Um, and I want to say thank you everyone for taking the time to join us, both the presenters and uh, the attendees here. Uh, this webinar was recorded, as you know, and we'll make it available on our YouTube channel. Um, if you missed the previous webinars, the recordings of those are also up on the YouTube channel. Um, so you can find that by searching for CCAST YouTube or, of course, uh, using the link that Alex put in the chat box. Um, you're also invited to join us on CCAST, of course. We do have a case study on this project. Uh, which Alex also put in the chat, um, and it's also on the bottom of this slide here. Uh, we hope you um, will be able to join us for our next webinar. We have one coming up on, on Tuesday, October 20th, to discuss the use of telemetry technology to learn about bull trout behavior in response to reservoir operations in Idaho. Um, please let me and uh, or Alex know if you would like to attend but didn't receive the, rep the webinar announcement or calendar invitation. We'll be happy to share that. Uh, you can also contact us if you're interested in joining the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. Um, with that, I want to give a final thanks to Bill and Chad for the presentation. You guys packed a whole lot into there uh, within an hour. Lots of, uh, I think, uh, useful information so, for folks. So thank you for that. And with that, we'll close. Thanks, everyone, for your time and hope you have a great Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, Bill and Chad.